Day of the Blizzard, Chapter 6 It was even worse than before. It wasn't snow anymore, but tiny icicles, sharp particles that stung her forehead and her cheeks. The sidewalk and street had vanished under soft white mounds in which all car tracks and footmarks had long ago disappeared. Walking through it was like climbing mountains, and after just a few steps Katie's legs ached and she was gasping for air. Another few steps and she knew she couldn't keep walking that way. Her enemy, the wind, had hold of her again, stabbing through her with icy fingers, punching her in the face. It was almost forty blocks to home. Mrs. Lemon was right. She'd never make it. Never. She tried going on anyway, but it seemed like each time she took one step forward, the storm pushed her back, too. On either side of the street, the wind had whipped the snow into towering snowbanks, six, seven feet tall. Katie sheltered behind one trying to catch her breath. The snow gave way under her weight like a soft feather bed. It would be nice, Katie thought, to let go, to sink into that downy softness, to close her eyes and rest. For a moment, she did close her eyes. Then sh someone shook her hard. A man and a woman were pulling her out of the snowbank. You foolish child, the man shouted. You'll freeze this way. What are you doing out alone in this storm? Don't you know you'll die if you go to sleep in the snow? You must always keep moving. I just wanted to rest a minute, Katie mumbled. Her heart pounded with fright. People sometimes did freeze to death. She had read about it in books. But those things happened out west, on the prairies, or in the wilderness, far north. They didn't happen in New York City, right in the middle of Third Avenue. Keep moving, the man told her. Keep walking until you get home. Don't rest any more. It's too dangerous out here. How far are you going? the woman asked. Is your home near? Do you know that the horse cars and trains have stopped running? But Katie couldn't answer. We can't just leave her here, Bill, the woman said. She'll fall again and freeze. Let's take her home with us, till the worst of the storm is over. Katie didn't protest. She felt numb inside and out. It didn't matter now. Nothing mattered. She couldn't get home on her own. All she knew was that she couldn't bear to be alone any more. And who else would help her? She'd never even make it back to the pawn shop. She was alone in a part of town where she didn't know anyone. She remembered the railroad depot. That wasn't very far, but Papa wasn't at the depot. He, too, was somewhere out there in the storm, in a stalled train or a faraway town. He didn't even know that Katie wasn't safely home with Mama, that she was wandering around alone. What would Papa tell her to do? Katie wondered. He would tell her to find shelter, Katie was sure. She let the woman take her by the hand and led her on. Even with the help, each mound of snow seemed harder to climb. Katie lost all sense of direction. Were they still walking uptown? How many blocks? Maybe somewhere there were still horse cars running, after all. Meanwhile, she just forced her, her legs to move on, step after step after step. They turned a corner. Katie could hardly see. Her eyes burned from the cold. The snow was so thick, it hung like a screen between her and her new friends. Katie was glad for the comforting touch of the woman's hand on her own. It took forever to walk the length of the block. The three of them clung together, pulling each other along. Once they barely dodged some falling shingles. Another time a piece of chimney crashed down just behind their backs. Halfway down the block a tangle of telephone wires barred their way. Farther along the sidewalk they had to skirt the broken branches of a fallen tree. At times they moved forward on hands and knees, finding their path by touch. Katie could hear the woman beside her panting with the effort. Her own breath escaped in labored puffs of steam. Another corner. Look, we are almost home, the woman said. I can see the sign of the Windsor Hotel. That's on 47th Street. Only two more blocks to our house. Two more blocks. To Katie it sounded like twenty. She stared at the big bulk of the Windsor Hotel. Rows of large, brightly lit windows splashed squares of yellow light onto the snow. How dark it was in the street. Was it night already, or was the star storm blotting out all the daylight? The Windsor Hotel. She knew that name. Where had she heard it before? Suddenly Katie remembered. Aunt Maggie. Aunt Maggie worked at the Windsor Hotel. By some strange pe kind of magic, these kind people had led her straight to the one person who would be able to help her. Katie explained. Suddenly she could talk again. Are you sure? the woman asked. Can you get to the hotel door by yourself? Katie was sure. 
She just just knowing that Aunt Maggie was nearby filled her with new strength. She hugged her new friends. Thank you, thank you so much. Then they were gone, swallowed up in the snowy haze. On her own, Katie found her way to the door. She stood just inside the entrance, dripping snow on the marble floor. For a moment, the heat and the bright lights were almost too much. Katie had to lean against one of the tall marble pillars to keep herself from falling. No one paid attention to her. The big high lobby of the Windsor was almost as crowded as a busy railroad depot. Well-dressed, people milled about, shoving each other in their haste to get to the desk clerk. Some argued with them, please, you must have a room for me. Someone pleaded, just a bed somewhere or a cot to spend the night. Katie felt timid and strange, all these fancy people. She'd never seen so many fur wraps and muffs and fur-collared coats in one place. Maybe she'd come in at the wrong place. How would she ever find Aunt Maggie in this huge place? Katie knew she couldn't just stand there. Slowly she walked to the back of the lobby. A man in a splendid uniform stood by the elevator, and he gave Katie an icy stare. Where do you think you're going? he asked. Katie wanted to answer, but the words stuck in her throat. Suddenly it was all too much. Mama in the storm, her long, long walk, her aching hands and feet. She fought her tears, but they welled up anyway, filling her eyes, spilling over. Aunt Maggie, she managed to get out. I'm looking for Maggie Murphy. The man's eyes softened. Suddenly he wasn't stiff and forbidding anymore. He took Katie by the hand and led her through long back passageways. One flight up, they came across the chambermaid, carrying an armful of towels. The maid wore a white apron over a gray dress and a little lace cap on her head. Can you find Maggie Murphy for this little lass? the man asked. Maggie is her auntie, and she needs her help. Some more stairs, more long carpeted hallways, and then Aunt Maggie was there in the same kind of gray dress and lace cap on her auburn hair. Katie flew into her arms, and now the tears really came, like a dam giving way. Katie, who never cried, Katie, Mama's dependable Kate, crying all over Aunt Maggie's apron until she could hardly cry any more. And the words came, too, between sobs, spilling out in bits and pieces about Mama's illness and about the brooch, about Papa being away and about the long trip through the snow. You foolish child, Aunt Maggie scolded, softly stroking Katie's hair. What a chance you took. No brooch in the world is worth taking chances like that. Then she smiled. But you are safe, she said, and that's all that counts. Now we'll just have to find a way to get us both, get both of us safely uptown. But Papa, what about Papa? Katie asked. Now that she herself was warm and safe, she couldn't bear to think of Papa still out in the storm. Your dad is smart, and he knows how to take care of himself, Aunt Maggie laughed. Once again, Katie could feel the warmth spreading through her body. She felt drowsy and content. Everything was all right. She didn't need to worry any more. Aunt Maggie would take care of everything. She'd take care of Katie and Mama, too. Aunt Maggie would know how to manage. Katie was so sure about Aunt Maggie that she wasn't even surprised when Aunt Maggie returned with the news that she'd found a way to get them home. One of the gentlemen on my floor, she explained, has a sleigh waiting outside. He's taking some of his friends to their homes, but he promised to squeeze us in. He's a nice man. Mr. Heatherton is. Aunt Maggie bustled about. She took off her apron and cap and put on her coat and hat. Now, just a word to the housekeeper, she said, and then we're off. But what if the housekeeper won't let you off? Katie worried. Now, don't you worry, my love, Aunt Maggie said. If she says no, I'll go anywhere. Nothing would make me stay with my own sister so sick and her little ones needing help. There are other jobs. It was still snowing, but the snow had let up a little when they got outside. The sleigh was waiting. The horses were covered with warm blankets. Aunt Maggie climbed on the driver's seat next to the coachman, but Mr. Heatherton made Katie sit inside the sleigh with him and his friends. He wrapped Katie into a warm lap robe so that nothing showed but her eyes and the tip of her nose. Even the sleigh horses had a hard time moving through the deep snow. They stopped and strained when they had to rest every few blocks. But Katie was too weary to care. She watched the big houses and street lamps of Fifth Avenue, 
moving past. She listened to the tinkling of the sleigh bells. She looked up at the trees along Central Park. Some were half down or had lost some of their branches to the storm, but their dark outlines still looked pretty against all that white snow. Katie wished she could forget her worries for a moment and pretend that this was just a happy outing in a, in a sleigh. She'd never had a sleigh ride like this before. How the twins would enjoy gliding along like this in splendor. She must remember every little detail for them. The sleek horses, the furry lap robe, the stately coachman with his towering high hat. They stopped at several houses to drop Mr. Heatherton's friends off. At 79th Street, Mr. Hes Heatherton got off, too. William will take you and the child home, he told Aunt Maggie. Oh, but we can manage from here, sir, Aunt Maggie protested. Nonsense, Mr. Heatherton said. I have daughters myself. I wouldn't want them trudging about in the storm. He patted Katie on the back. Take care of yourself, little one, he said. They turned east. The sleigh crossed the bridge over the open railroad cut on 4th Avenue. The deep trench was half filled with snow. It would be a while before trains could pass here. Once again, Katie thought of Papa. She wondered if he was safe. How would he get home? She hoped he wasn't cold and hungry. Third Avenue, Second Avenue, and they were home. Across the street, the snowdrifts were piled so high they almost reached the second-story windows. But her own side was almost clear. The coachman carried Katie into the house. Aunt Maggie was close behind her, her skirt trailing in the snow. Aunt Maggie helped Katie up the stairs. Katie's fingers and toes had started to hurt again, a dull, throbbing ache. Katie and Aunt Maggie pounded on the door. It was Michael who flung it open. Kevin was right behind him. The Rileys were there, and Mama was propped up in bed. Katie, you're safe. Thank God, she cried. She still sounded awfully weak, but she clasped Katie's hand in her own so tightly it felt as if she'd never let it go. Then Katie gave Mama the brooch. She tried, she tried to pin it on Mama's nightgown, but her fingers were too stiff and sore. Aunt Maggie had to help. Mama kept touching the brooch, her eyes shining. Then Aunt Maggie took charge. She helped Katie undress, as if Katie were no older than Kevin and Michael. She rubbed Katie's throbbing fingers and toes and gently bathed them in lukewarm water. Then she took Katie into Papa's side of the bed, next to Mama. My two patients. Aunt Maggie left. Then she got busy again, scrubbing the twins and fixing supper, freshening Mama's sheets and blankets, tidying all the rooms. In the meantime, everyone talked and talked until Katie was nearly hoarse, over and over. Katie had to tell about her ride on the L, about climbing down the ladder, about fighting the wind and the snow. Time to go to sleep, Aunt Maggie said firmly. Tomorrow is another day. She tucked Katie tightly under her covers. She tucked down, turned down the kerosene lamp and went to close the curtains. It's still snowing, she said. Warm in bed, Katie felt snug and happy. It felt good to be cozy and safe when the winds howled outside. She wished she could be sure that Papa was safe, too. Mr. Riley had assured her again that trainmen knew what to do in a storm. Yes, Katie thought. Papa was smart. He'd do the right thing, and he'd be home as soon as the storm was over. Then they'd talk about their adventures. About being out in the bad storm, the worst storm ever in New York City. In the dark, she remembered her own day. It had been hard and scary, but she'd done what she'd set out to do. But only because people had helped her. So many kind and nice people. The boy at the ladder. Mr. and Mrs. Lemon in the pawn shop. The friendly couple on the street. Mr. Heatherton and his sleigh. And, of course, Aunt Maggie. With a sigh, Katie closed her eyes. She could sleep now because Aunt Maggie was here. Katie turned over and snuggled deeper under her covers. Perhaps the storm would let up by morning. With Aunt Maggie here to take care of Mama, maybe she and the twins could have fun in the snow.